Welcome to Richmond Library. We'll go ahead and get started. I am Lee Snellgrove. I'm the Art and Culture Manager here at Richmond Library. Uh, we're excited to have you tonight. Thanks for coming. I think this will be a great uh, event. Uh, if you haven't already, um, just a reminder, uh, you can check in, uh, scan your library card, or give us a zip code. That helps kind of, especially if you scan your library card, it helps us give recommendations for future events through the website that you might be interested in if you're interested in an event like this. I'm going to get my notes real quick so I don't forget <laughs> anything. Got a lot to do. A lot, of, a lot of people to thank and things like that. Um, so, uh, I want to let you know about some upcoming events that we have. We have quite a few this weekend uh, that are quite good. Our artist in residence, Terrence Henderson, will be teaching a dance class uh, next week. It, we're obviously in the spooky season because we have some scary things like a horror movie series and uh, the not so spooky Halloween stroll next week for the kiddos to walk around downtown and get some candy. Um, I also, you're all probably musically inclined people, and I want to make sure you know that the Richmond Library just launched this week its vinyl collection. Uh, so we have a, a collection of about 150 um, albums to start. They are right outside this room in the middle of the film and sound area uh, that you can check out and take home and play on your own record player. And if you don't have a record player, we actually have one available in our library of things that you can also check out. So you can grab that album and, and play it wherever you want to go. Um, I want to uh, thank, uh, and one note about the vinyl collection, we got help from our friends at Papa Jazz to curate that collection. So it is a good collection of both some old stuff and new stuff that's really exciting. Um, I want to thank the School of Information Science and the College of Information and Communications for uh, bringing Chris to Columbia. And he's had a full, um, roster of events and meeting with classrooms and going to see students so um it's really exciting and he gets to go to a his first sec, SEC football game this weekend uh, so thank you to usc and uh the school of information science for having this um making this happen so uh, i will go ahead and introduce chris our guest tonight um Chris Melanthi is a chart analyst and pop critic who writes about the intersection of culture and commerce in popular music. For Slate, he created and hosts the Hit Parade podcast and writes their Why Is This Song Number One series. His work has also appeared in Rolling Stone, Pitchfork, Vulture, NPR's music, the NPR Music's The Record, The Village Voice, Billboard, and CMJ. Chris has also been a frequent guest on National Public Radio, All Things Considered, Soundcheck, Planet Money, On the Media, and on Slate's podcast, The Gist and The Culture Gap Fest. So, welcome Chris Melanthi. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, just say a few things and we'll see. Can you all hear me? Yeah, sounds pretty good. Thumbs up. Um, so, when uh, I was invited here, I was told that uh, what would really, you know, appeal to the crowd would be uh, a talk about um, uh, music and popular culture in South Carolina. And uh, in particular, uh, I was told that uh, a favorite son of um, South Carolina is a certain musician named Darius Rucker, who is the uh, lead singer of a band called Hootie and the Blowfish. And I thought what might be fun this is not typically how I put together a Hit Parade episode. Um, you know, Hit Parade, for those of you who are not familiar, is, as I call it, a podcast of pop chart history. So I'm looking at um, music history through the lens of the billboard charts. That's kind of my field of expertise. Uh, they sometimes colloquially call me the chart whisperer. Uh, and, you know, on the one hand, um, I write about the charts the way a critic would, and yet I also sort of explain how they work. And when I'm creating a hip rate episode, the show has now been on for about five and a half years, uh, I'm typically looking for a chart angle through which I can view an artist's career. And I've not created a hip parade episode about Hootie and the Blowfish or Darius Rucker. I think I've br brought them up once or twice in passing. Um, but 
it's Darius Rucker's career is really an interesting story, and it touches on a lot of the things that I find interesting uh, in pop, uh, particularly uh, as it concerns genre, or as radio people call it, format, um, and how Hootie broke and how Darius went on to the now very successful solo career that he's had. So what I did is I threw together some slides um, that will give you a sense of the way I frame a Hit Parade episode. And this might turn into a Hit Parade episode. Uh, frankly, what this reminds me most of, if I may digress for a second, is uh, I uh, frequently have spoken at a, an annual conference called the Pop Conference. Uh, for many years, it appeared in Seattle at the Experience Music Project. It's now being hosted by the Clive Davis School at NYU. And frankly, I have turned several pop conference papers, which I have presented to an audience not unlike yourselves, uh, I've turned them into podcast episodes. It turns out to be a good proving ground for something that later works as a podcast. So what you're seeing here is kind of the first draft of something that might turn into a podcast. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to present these slides, and uh, there'll even be a slight interactive portion where you can do some trivia. So here it goes. So uh, I don't know if you all are aware, but uh, a book came out literally in 2022, so this year, called Only Want to Be With You by Tim Summer. And Tim Summer is a former musician who became an A&R representative, an a, uh, artist and repertoire manager at Atlantic Records. And he was the guy who signed Hootie and the Blowfish. And he wrote basically a biography of Hootie and the Blowfish and how he came to sign them. And it's an interesting story. And I'm, I've been reading this book and it's, it's fascinating because if you care about South Carolina lore, USC lore, it's all over the book. And I, I won't read word for word everything that you see in this slide right here, but these are a couple of images from the book. Uh, you know, here we, on the top, we have uh, Darius Rucker, uh, you know, how he got discovered, so to speak, by one of his bandmates in college singing in the shower uh, in a dorm at USC in uh, 1985. Um, and uh, I'll talk in a minute about the song he was singing. And uh, below, you see an excerpt where they were playing a well-known venue, Green Streets, uh, that uh, was a proving ground for Hootie and the Blowfish after they became a very popular local cover, covers band. Um, so this is part of the lore of Darius Rucker's story and, by extension, Hootie and the Blowfish's story. However, what's also interesting about Darius's career is how his career is a prime example of how chart success is a product of musical trend. And really, you can kind of break down Rucker's career into three periods driven by genre. There's the peak of Hootie and the Blowfish, which is the alt-pop era. There's a very, very brief dalliance with R&B. Um, and you know, obviously, there are racial intersectional implications of that. And then finally, there is his latest uh, successful solo incarnation as a country star. And I'm going to take these in order. So for starters, there's what I'm going to call the alt-pop phase. And I'll explain what I mean by that in a moment. So Rucker, who was born in 1966, uh, had very eclectic tastes growing up. Um, he tells a story in Summer's book about how he was flipping through his mom's record collection and saw Otis Redding records and Al Green records. But then somewhere in the middle of that collection, he also saw a Beatles record. He saw the single, I Want to Hold Your Hand. And that you know, intrigued him. Um, he was also into country music. Uh, Kenny Rogers' The Gambler was a cover that uh, he was known to, to sing. Um, as I mentioned a minute ago, he was discovered by his bandmate singing in a USC dorm. And the song he was singing, uh, so that it echoed off the, the tiles in the bathroom, was the song Honesty by Billy Joel, a hit from Billy's uh, 1978 album, 52nd Street, that was a single in 1979. Uh, among the covers that uh, Hootie and the Blowfish played in their early salad days, their uh, covers band days were Take It Easy by the Eagles, which of course is kind of a country rock classic, and Sail On by the Commodores, which is an interesting record because the Commodores, of course, are a funk and R&B band that also 
um, because of Lionel Richie's interesting background as somebody who himself was interested in country music, Sail On frankly sounds as much like a country record as it does like an R&B record. So it's kind of a perfect Darius Rucker song to cover. And finally, I have George Michael pictured here because there's a great anecdote in Summer's book about how um, he and uh, a bandmate, uh, their bassist, uh, would uh, get high and listen to records together. And uh, it was when his bandmate was high that he could put on things that were not rock. And he put on George Michael one time. And his, uh, his bandmate said, darn you. And frankly, he didn't use the word darn. Uh, <laughs> you made me like George Michael. So I'm just presenting the eclectic world that made up Darius Rucker's tastes, which bears out in his career later on. Now, by their own admission, Hootie and the Blowfish were heavily influenced by 80s indie rock, and specifically the band R.E.M. R.E.M., of course, not from South Carolina, but from Georgia, from Athens, Georgia, itself a college town. Um, several members of the band in Tim Summers' book talk about how when an R.E.M. album would come out in the 1980s, they would buy it and literally play it incessantly and learn how to cover half its songs. At one point, they estimated that a typical Hootie and the Blowfish set would consist of maybe a dozen R.E.M. covers, uh, plus a few other covers and maybe a couple of originals. So, you know, uh, the, uh, what you see here on the right, by the way, is a picture of the very young men when they were at USC uh, and uh, still had their original drummer. And uh, those are a couple of the R.E.M. albums. They particularly idolized uh, R.E.M.'s 1983 debut, Murmur, uh, which is a, a very mysterious, murky record. Uh, the, the picture on the cover has kudzu, uh, so it's kind of a southern gothic record. And then uh, on top of that is their 1985 album, Fables of the Reconstruction, which had just come out when Darius Rucker uh, matriculated at um, USC. And so it was a particular favorite of the band. Um, and you know, the reason REM in particular are important is that REM kind of defined the bounds of what alternative rock would become by the 90s. They were jangly, they were calling back to certain 60s tropes but modernizing them. They were um, elliptical in their lyrics, so sometimes you didn't entirely know what REM lead singer Michael Stipe was singing. Um, and you know, Hootie and the Blowfish kind of took that jangle pop sound and fused it with their own influences and kind of came up with their own hybrid of that. Um, now, by the time Hootie and the Blowfish got signed in the early 90s, the pop crossover of alternative rock, as it was known, was in full swing. So what was alternative in the 80s uh, and considered, you know, left of the dial, as they said, or, you know, a little uncommercial, um, started to take over the charts by around 1991. Uh, here you see on top uh, R.E.M. Uh, with their 1991 album Out of Time actually topped the Billboard pop album chart. That was a remarkable moment. This is about six months, by the way, before the band Nirvana tops the album chart with Nevermind, which was itself an epical moment in 90s rock. Uh, here we have the band Pearl Jam, who are a little closer to the Hootie and the Blowfish model. Uh, their album uh, 10, peaked at number two on the charts in 1992. Uh, and finally, you have sort of a second tier of bands that were doing just as well in the wake of bands like R.E.M., Nirvana, and Pearl Jam, uh, the Gin Blossoms, who scored a number one Heat Seekers album in Billboard. And later, that album, New Miserable Experience, spun off several top 40 hits, uh, went double platinum, and cracked the Billboard top 40. And what you see on the right is uh, the cover of Hootie and the Blowfish's EP, Coochie Pop. Uh, yes, that was its name, um, and uh, it was a, an inside joke by the band. And um, this album was heavily influenced by all of this kind of rustic alternative rock that was just starting to dominate the charts. So Hootie and the Blowfish got signed to Atlantic Records in 1993, at the moment when alternative rock was already kind of dominating the charts. And it was a, an auspicious time. And here was the thing about alternative rock. It was the, the cynical question that is often asked about alternative rock is, well, OK, but is it, what is it an alternative to? Alternative to what? Right? Because once it becomes the center of the bullseye, it's not really the alternative anymore. And certainly, uh, Hootie and the Blowfish's critics uh, complained that 
Hootie was taking the sound of bands like R.E.M. and mainstreaming it even further, which is a time-honored tradition in popular music. Um, and sure enough, they released their debut album, Cracked Rear View, not their debut debut, they had released several albums independently, but their major label debut on Atlantic Records in 1994. It uh, cracks the Billboard 200 album chart there, which is Billboard's flagship pop album chart, uh, in July of 1994, uh, debuting at number uh, 127, uh, which, believe it or not, was not bad for a brand new band. Um, and it takes the better part of a year to get all the way to number one. So by the time uh, May of 95 rolls around, uh, Hootie uh, and the Blowfish achieve their first week at number one out of eight weeks at number one. And what was remarkable about that album in particular in 95 was that it kept going back to number one. So it would go to number one for a few weeks, then something else would replace it for a couple weeks, then Cracked Rear View would go back again and again and again. And in total, it spent eight weeks on top. Um, what was also interesting about the hits from Cracked Rear View, you may know several of them. There's Hold My Hand, there's Let Her Cry, the cover of which is pictured right here. Uh, there's Only Want to Be With You, which of course gives Tim Summer the title of his book. Um, these singles, they did touch on Billboard's modern rock tracks chart, which was basically their alternative rock chart. But they did far better on the album rock chart, which was kind of the more traditional rock chart. As you can see, if you squint very closely here, you can see that they are sharing space with bands like Van Halen or, you know, Bush. Um, so so-called alternative rock is already infusing the mainstream. Um, and then on the Hot 100, which of course is the flagship pop chart, the Hot 100, for those of you who are unfamiliar, is Billboard's main singles chart. If you listen to Casey Kasem 40 years ago on the American Top 40, he was counting down the top 40 songs on that chart. So it is to this day our flagship pop chart. When somebody says this is the number one song in the country, they probably mean the number one song on the Billboard Hot 100. On the Hot 100, let Her Cry, which is the single I'm focusing on here, uh, also reached the top 10. It was Hootie's second top 10 single after Hold My Hand. They scored three top 10 singles from that album, the third being Only Want to Be With You, which reached the top five. So the point being that Hootie did all right in, alter in alternative rock circles, but they did far, far better in mainstream rock and pop circles. Um, as you can see on the Modern Rock Tracks chart, they only got as high as number 34 on that chart. So, here's our first interactive thing. Um, it's a trivia question. And uh, this is a little arcane, but I'm going to throw it out there, and if anybody wants to answer, feel free. The question is this. What was Darius Rucker's best-selling week on the Billboard 200 album chart ever, either with Hootie and the Blowfish or solo? And here are your choices. The week Cracked Rear View hit number one, which we just saw on the previous slide, that was in 1995. Uh, Cracked Rear View's seventh week at number one, which was its best-selling week at number one, also in 1995. The debut week for Hootie and the Blowfish's follow-up album, Fairweather Johnson, in 1996. Or the debut week for Rucker's country debut, Learn to Live, which we will talk about a little later. Anybody who want to hazard a guess? All right, we're going with D. I think it's the season, it's like a And you are correct. The correct answer is C, the debut week for Fairweather Johnson. So here's what's interesting about this. Um, Cracked Rear View, as I pointed out, took the better part of a year to get to number one. And it sold very steadily week by week through that period. There was no burst of album sales that made Hootie and the Blowfish number one. It was sort of a, a steady accretion of sales. Uh, and by the way, Cracked Rear View was the number one album for all of 1995. It was the most consistent selling album. Um, as I will describe in this next slide, Fairweather Johnson, given the pent up demand for whatever Hootie and the Blowfish put out, uh, Fairweather Johnson was gonna do incredibly well no matter what. Uh, I have a term for this. I actually have done a hip parade episode about this phenomenon. I call it the ACDC rule. And let me explain what that phenomenon is. Uh, ACDC, of course, the Scotch-Australian metal band uh, in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. 
uh, their most famous album. If I, if I asked you, what's the most famous album by ACDC, what would you say? Anyone? Back in Black. Back in Black. Excellent. You nailed it in one. Back in Black is by far ACDC's best-selling album. By the way, it is one of the best-selling albums, period, of all time. I think it ranks somewhere in the top 20. It has sold somewhere in the neighborhood of 22 million copies in the United States alone. It is a mega, mega blockbuster. This is the album that contains You Shook Me All Night Long, the song Back in Black, Hell's Bells. It's a perennial for metal fans. Um, Back in Black only peaked at number four on the album chart. It sold very well and very steadily, but it didn't have a single week where it was the best-selling album. However, the album that ACDC released directly after Back in Black, an album called For Those About to Rock, We Salute You, which came out in 1981, Back in Black came out in 1980, that went to number one in just a couple of weeks because, of course, anything the band put out after Back in Black was inevitably going to go to number one. So... The ACDC rule, as I define it, and I, I picked ACDC because the disparity between that best-selling album that only peaked at number four, Back in Black, 22 million, and For Those About to Rock, We Salute You, which went to number one, but cumulatively in its life has only sold about four million copies. Impressive, but not as impressive as Back in Black. It's one of the starkest differences between a slow-growing, best-selling album and its fast-selling but lower-selling follow-up. So what the ACDC rule basically states is that the initial sales of any album are a referendum on the previous album, not the album that they are actually buying. If you caught on to a band and you are excited for their next album, you are going to run out in week one and go buy that album and it's gonna have an explosive debut that may not reflect the legacy of that album. And I, in, if you, choose to go back to listen to my ACDC rule episode. I believe it's the February 2021 episode of Hit Parade. You will hear me describe all manner of albums. Billy Joel's first number one album is not The Stranger, which by many yardsticks is his most famous album. It is 52nd Street, the album after The Stranger. Uh, Jackson Brown's first number one album is not Running On Empty. It is um, 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 Hold Out, which is the album after Running On Empty. Uh, if you are a fan of British alternative rock, Depeche Mode's number one album is not the uh, Violator album, which has most of their hits. It is Songs of Faith and Devotion, the album after Violator. So this recurs throughout chart history. You can point to the 60s right through the 21st century, and you will find many examples of the ACDC rule. Fairweather Johnson is a signal example of the ACDC rule. Again, Cracked Review, which came out in 1994 and had its peak sales week in August of 1995, it's 54th chart week, so more than a year later. In that peak week, it sold 184,000 copies. Nothing to sneeze at. That's an impressive sales total. And by the way, it reached number one for the first time in its 44th chart week. The final Recording Industry Association of America certification total for Cracked Beer Review, it's one of the best-selling albums of all time, is 16 million copies. That is a staggering total. That's like those are Beatles numbers. That is a, a huge, huge number. Fairweather Johnson, on the other hand, opens in 1996, the week, uh, the week ending May 11th, 1996, at 411,000 copies. Now remember, that's more than double any single week that Cracked Rear View ever had. It debuts at number one, of course, no surprise there. But its final Recording Industry Association of America certification is only 3 million copies. So Hootie and the Blowfish were a phenomenon. They broke big, they kind of galvanized the REM style alternative rock sound and mainstreamed it for a large crowd. They sold very well at the peak of the compact disc. Um, reportedly many people bought Cracked Rear View through Columbia House record clubs, that kind of thing. Uh, if you go to any used record store, you'll probably find copies of Cracked Rear View CDs filling the bins. Many people have ripped their copies of Cracked Review to iTunes and given the CD away. Uh, there are a lot of copies of Cracked Review floating around out there. And then there was pent-up demand for Fairweather Johnson. It did all right. It got respectful reviews, not great reviews, and it fell off the charts within a year, uh, le considerably less than a year. I believe it was off the charts before Christmas of 1996. So that was the trajectory of Hootie and the Blowfish. Now, let's talk about what Darius Rucker did next. Hootie released a couple more albums in the 90s, each sold a little bit less than the last. 
And when Rucker decided he wanted to go solo, the question was, what sound would he pursue? Now remember, as I talked about at the beginning here, Rucker's influences range widely, right? He's into rock, R&B, country. He, he's into a little of everything. And to the label that he signed with in the early 2000s, the natural move for an African-American artist who was trying to go solo, and given his, you know, gravelly baritone and his, you know, his powerful gospel-derived voice, would be to do an R&B album, and that is exactly what he did. So Darius Rucker's debut solo album was called Back to Then. It came out in 2002, and he focused on the R&B side of his background and updated that sound for the aughts, for the 21st century. Uh, Neo Soul was a movement that uh, kind of took over R&B in the mid to late 90s into the early 2000s. Some signature artists from Neo Soul include Maxwell, D'Angelo, uh, Erica Badu. Um, these were artists who did quite well for themselves with the Neo Soul sound. It was basically taking late 60s, early 70s R&B and infusing it with a kind of post-hip-hop vibe, but still maintaining a bit of the old school sound at the same time. So All Music in 2002 gave uh, Back to Then a fairly positive review. They said Neo Soul boutique label Hidden Beach, whose signee Jill Scott, that's Jill Scott you see on the right there, has a duet with Rucker on the record, was a logical home. So Rucker took his album to the label Hidden Beach, which was known for its Neo Soul. Working with urban musicians and producers, Rucker has constructed his own version of a neo-soul album, touching upon elements of gritty soul and gospel, but filtering them through his pop rock sensibility. So in other words, this is Darius's vision of a neo-soul album. Now, here's our next trivia question. Where did Darius Rucker's 2002 debut solo album, Back to Then, debut and peak? A, number one, B, number five, C, number 57, or D, number 127? Anyone want to hazard a guess? The correct answer is D. It was not a success, to say the least. It was off the charts in just two weeks. Rucker's take on Neo Soul was just not as commercial as what was ruling the pop and R&B charts in 2002. So I'm, I'm showing some albums that were doing particularly well on the charts in 2002. Uh, you'll see on the upper left, that's Ashanti. She scored a massive number one hit that year called Foolish and an accompanying number one album. Uh, there was the rapper Nelly with his second album, Nellyville. That was a massive success that year. Uh, on the going clockwise, you've got Missy Elliott who released her album Under Construction. It's her best-selling album that came out that year. It's got the single Work It, if you're familiar with that, the one where she sings backwards on the chorus. Great record. And then finally, uh, Erica Badu uh, released uh, her latest album in 2002, and it did quite well, and it uh, featured uh, one of her signature R&B hits, Love of My Life, which was a number one hit that year. Um, Darius Rucker's attempt at Neo Soul just was not in step with either the Neo Soul of Erica Badu or the kind of mainstream hip hop derived R&B of an Ashanti, a Nelly, or a Missy Elliott. So here was Rucker trying to surf the genre trends and just not quite catching it. And perhaps it was his pop rock side that was peeking through. Maybe it wasn't appropriate for R&B radio. Um, I checked, by the way, none of the tracks from back to then even cracked the R&B chart, let alone the Hot 100. Um, but it was not a sound that was going to make him a solo star. So what does he do next? Next, he tries country. Now, there was evidence as far back as the 90s, even though none of the tracks by Hootie and the Blowfish actually cracked the Billboard Hot Country Songs chart, there was evidence that there was some purchase for Hootie's music with the country audience. Only Want to Be With You was kind of a bar band favorite. Um, you know, the sports infused video for that track was very popular, uh, not just on MTV, but on, uh, you know, other video channels across the country. Um, and I think, frankly, after the failure of Back to Then and the R&B attempt, Darius reasonably thought, well, I have nothing to lose. 
why not? I love country. Um, he had a voice suited for, as suited for country as it was suited for R&B. And so he gave it a shot. He signed to Capital's Nashville division, the, the name of the label is literally Capital Nashville, in 2008. And he worked, this is an important detail, he worked with seasoned country producers and songwriters. And I am currently working on a book, I'm uh, in the home stretch on it right now, uh, about uh, the artist Lil Nas X. Uh, if those of you remember, a couple years ago he got into uh, a bit of controversy over whether his song Old Town Road was country or hip hop or pop or comedy or what have you. And one of the bromides about country and about the so-called Nashville industrial complex is that Nashville likes it best when you are working within the system. And Darius, to his credit, or at least to his commercial benefit, worked with seasoned country producers and songwriters. So the album Learn to Live, his country debut, his second solo album, but his country debut, was produced by a man named Frank Rogers who had previously worked with the country stars Brad Paisley and Trace Adkins. And it debuted on the Billboard 200 album chart all the way up at number five, considerably better than number 127. And even more importantly, the first single, Don't Think, I Don't Think About It, was co-written by a guy named Clay Mills, who had previously written songs for the likes of Diamond Rio and Trisha Yearwood. And that went all the way to number one on the Hot Country Songs chart. That was a very big deal. How big a deal? Here's our third and final trivia question. When Darius Rucker reached number one on Hot Country Songs, how many years had it been since a black soloist had done that? A, 46 years, B, 25 years, C, 23 years, or D, 12 years? Anybody want to have something? A? The correct answer is B. Now, let me explain why I propose 46 years. 46 years before 2008 was 1962. That is when Ray Charles famously released the album Modern Sounds in Country and Western Music. That's a good guess, and I, I'll admit I was trying to throw you off with that one. Here's the thing about Modern Sounds in Country and Western Music, a great album, legendary. Praise to the heavens. It did well on uh, the pop album chart, and it spun off the single I Just Can't Stop Loving You, which topped the Hot 100. It did reasonably well on the R&B chart because Ray Charles, through the 50s, had a great history with R&B. It was not played on country radio or charted on the country chart at all. So it hadn't been 46 years since there had been a number one hit for Ray Charles because none of the tracks from Modern Sounds and Country and Western Music made the country chart at all. It was considered inconceivable in 1962 that an artist uh, uh, like Ray Charles coming into country from the left, as it were, could be played on country radio, despite the sound, the countrypolitan sound of modern sounds. Uh, what happened in, tw uh, uh, let me explain the uh, other choices. Uh, 12 years is just a MacGuffin. Uh, 23 years before 2008 was 1985. That year was when Ray Charles finally did go to number one on the uh, Hot Country Songs chart in a duet with Willie Nelson on a song called Seven Spanish Angels. So Ray Charles finally got his number one hit, not as a soloist, but in a duet with Willie Nelson in 1985. Uh, the correct answer is B, 25 years, because Rucker became the first black soloist at number one since Charlie Pride. Of course, Charlie Pride, a legend in country music. Charlie Pride had, I believe, I, I need to double check this number, I believe he had 17 or 18 country number ones. I mean, the guy was just prolific, uh, a hit maker through the late 60s into the early 80s. His final number one single came in 1983. It was a song called Night Games. And between 1983 and 2008, not a single black soloist topped the Hot Country Songs chart. And Rucker was the one who finally broke that logjam, not counting the uh, Willie Nelson and Ray Charles duet in 1985. And uh, just to close it out, since his 2008 breakthrough, Rucker has scored another six Hot Country chart toppers. Probably the one you're most familiar with, I'm going to get hazard to guess, is Wagon Wheel which uh, has an interesting backstory. It's a song by Bob Dylan that was then completely rearranged by the band Old Crow Medicine Show. So technically what Darius Rucker is covering with his version of Wagon Wheel is the Old Crow Medicine Show rearrangement of Dylan's original song. And uh, it has arguably become Rucker's signature song as well as the signature song of Old Crow Medicine Show. And as you see, this, uh, this scan right here is from uh, the Billboard Book of Hot Country Songs. 
uh, by Joel Whitburn, just running down all of the hits that Darius Rucker has had since 2008, and it is a considerable list of songs indeed. And that is what I have for you all today. Uh, conceivably, this will turn into a hit parade episode at some point. But. And you know, as I said, this was something I wanted to share with you all so you could see how chart data and that lens could tell a story about an artist's career and about music, race, genre, format. Uh, these are the things that my podcast covers on the regular. So, hope you enjoyed them. Right. Anybody have questions? I'll come around with the mic. So when you come back next year, and you've already covered Darius, who is the next South Carolina person you would cover? <laughs> I don't know. I, 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 would, I would take your suggestions. I mean, Darius Rucker is, is kind of perfect for Hit Parade because he has such a high profile. He scored massive hits. And as I like to say, I'm, I'm, I'm not answering your question. I'm answering a different version of your question because I, <laughs> nobody's leaping to mind right now. Uh, but what makes Darius Rucker ideal for Hit Parade is that there's an arc to his story. There's this high peak in the 90s, there's this massive dip in the early 2000s that is driven in part by his multifarious background. I mean, this is a black man who loves rock and roll, country music. He kind of loves a little of everything. And he figures, well, if I'm going to go solo, I need to try R&B, and it doesn't work counterintuitively, the thing that works for Darius Rucker's country music. The reason I can't think of anybody who quite, any South Carolina musician who quite has that arc is uh, you need that kind of story to work for a podcast episode. So if you all have any suggestions, I welcome them. Dizzy, Dizzy Gillespie. Dizzy Gillespie, that's a pretty good one. I'll have to look into that. The only problem with Dizzy Gillespie is that probably if he charted, it probably predates the rock era, and so the Billboard chart data will be scant for Dizzy Gillespie. But nonetheless, Dizzy is certainly worthy. How long does it take you, this pressing two parts, how long does it take you to prepare a typical episode of Hit Parade, and how many, I've heard you mention on there, on the podcast before, you have several, like, that you're working on. So how long does it take to prepare a single episode, typically, and how many do you have kind of backed up in your backlog, ready to go? It's a fair question. I'll answer the second question first, which is, I'm always, I've always got sort of a backlog of germs of ideas that I'm waiting for the right moment. For example, the episode I just released last week about the history of 70s funk. Finished it on my way here. Okay. Awesome, thank you, thank you all. Um, so, I'd been wanting to do something on that topic for years. I probably thought up the germ of that idea two to three years ago. What finally m triggered my doing it, and you heard it when you listened to the episode, was that this is the 50th anniversary of Curtis Mayfield's Superfly album, which was the number one album in the country literally this week in 1972. Um, and that's a signature album for funk. It kind of proves the commercial viability of funk at the turn of the 70s. And after Superfly, you have a wave of funk albums and funk singles doing very well on the charts. You know, James Brown helps invent funk. He, he all but pioneers funk. But James never had a number one single or album. It was Curtis Mayfield who achieved that. Uh, I have to give credit where credit is due. My executive producer, and that guy named, uh, who works for Slate named Derek John, uh, asked me over the summer, he said, hey, by the way, are you going to do anything with the 50th anniversary of Curtis Mayfield's Superfly? And I'm like, oh, yeah, what you just did? I kind of went, uh -huh. I've been wanting to do something about funk for at least two years. So that was the eureka moment. I've had a lot of those eureka moments. I wanted to do something with Carol King's Tapestry at one point. And last year, when it was the 50th anniversary of 1971 in Tapestry, and frankly, I was hitting my own 50th birthday, <laughs> it seemed like as good an excuse as any to do a, uh, uh, an episode centering around the music of 1971, and especially Carol King's Tapestry. Um, I'm always looking for some kind of cultural peg. Another one that I did, uh, I believe, in, I think it was March of 2020, I had long wanted to do an episode about uh, the Latin pop explosion of 1999. Ricky Martin, Enrique Iglesias, Jennifer Lopez, Mark Anthony, 
uh, that was a really interesting moment. And I was waiting for the right peg, and you may recall that uh, just this was literally the Super Bowl right before the pandemic. Um, the halftime show was uh, Jennifer Lopez and Shakira. And I watched that halftime show and I thought, oh, this is it. This is the moment. I need to do the Latin pop episode now. And sure enough, the next month, that was our Latin pop episode. So that's how I sort of take ideas that are on the back burner and move them to the front burner. As for how long it takes me to do an episode, I mean, I've now done 62 of these suckers and I'm definitely more efficient now than I was early on. I can generally do the, the bulk of the work in about two weeks, but some of the research will take the better part of a month. Um, I mean, I'm it. I'm the guy researching the show and writing the show. I'm a one-man band in that regard. I'm not a one-man band in terms of putting the show together. That's what I have a producer for, thank heaven, because I don't know how to operate you know, Pro Tools or any of the tools that he uses to splice together the clips. I'm very specific when I'm preparing a show, like, okay, I need you to fade up on this part of the song, this part of the chorus, this part of the bridge. You know, we're, I'm talking about uh, the bass line of Good Times by Chic. I need you to fade up on that part of the bass line so that we can hear the crossfade later of, you know, Rapper's Delight that uses the bass line, that kind of thing. So I'm often giving a lot of direction, but the hard work of cutting together my talk track with the songs, that's the producer's job. But yeah, all, all in an episode takes me the better part of a month, and the, the most furious part of the writing and editing takes uh, a couple of weeks. Thank you. Hi, Chris. Continuing the conversation from dinner. Yes. Hi. Uh, <laughs> so you mentioned Lil Nas X in 2019 thing with the genre and the categorization and the charts and that yep. being a, a big thing. And that brings up that question of genre is dead, genre doesn't work anymore, and Gen Z doesn't think that way. Mm -hmm. um, thinking while uh, m more embracing terms from the 80s, 90s, 2000s, and the changes that have been happening. Right. How do you think the charts uh, will change, have changed, are adapting with, with the, the reconceptualization of genre in general? You know, an artist thinking of genre. Yeah, I mean, this is a very fraught issue. And, it, and frankly, so what I'm working on is a book for uh, a series being published by Duke University Press called Singles. If any of you in the audience, I'm digressing for a moment, have heard of a, a book series called 33 and the Third, where each book is about a single album. So there's a book about Sgt. Pepper, there's a book about Nevermind, there's a book about, you name it, Rio by Duran Duran, et cetera. Uh, this is a companion series by Duke University Press where each book is about a single song. And I was approached a little over two years ago by the folks at Duke University Press to do a book about Old Town Road, specifically that song. So I'm not just doing a book about Little Nas X, I'm doing a book specifically about Old Town Road. And Old Town Road is a useful prism to talk about the history of the charts and especially to your question, the history of genre. Because of course that was the contretemps, the, the dispute over Old Town Road. Old Town Road, for those of you who are not aware, was briefly on Billboard's Hot Country Songs chart, and then it was yanked from that chart when factions within Nashville said, this is not a country record. And that raised a, a, you know, a series of intersectional questions over, well, what is a country record? I mean, if this record sounds like a country record and has country instrumentation, and even, even the inclusion of so-called trap drums, you know, hip-hop drums, if that disqualifies it, there are lots of records by the likes of Florida Georgia Line that chart country all the time that have similar trap drums. So it, a lot of the, the defining of genre is a little bit like Potter Stewart's definition on pornography. I know it when I see it. You know, I know it when I hear it. And that is becoming more fraught as time goes on. Um, and one of the things I talk about in the book is that Billboard has struggled with this really throughout its history. You know, back in the 40s when they had a chart called race records, because that was the term of art for R&B before the term rhythm and blues was coined. Uh, back then, believe it or not, they called country records folk records. Then they called it folk parentheses country and western, and then finally they settled on country and western and then just country. But that, that evolution took a few years. But it's gotten particularly fraught in the 21st century, to your point, as the genres have started to blur a little bit. There's a book by um, a fellow critic and a friend of mine named Eric Weisbart. He did a book called Top 40 Democracy, 
where he points out that radio stations don't actually program themselves around genre, they program themselves around format. So adult contemporary is a format, or triple A or adult album alternative is a format. Um, and yes, R&B and hip hop can be a format, but it's also a genre. And so there's, there's some confusion over what a genre is versus what a format is. I don't, as long as terrestrial radio continues to exist, I think formats will continue to exist. The question, what's implied in your question is, should genre even <coughs> exist? I am of the opinion that genre is still useful to track what a subculture is listening to. My, my basic take on genre is that genre is best defined by its audience. If the audience thinks it's country, it's country. If an audience thinks it's hip hop, it's hip hop. Um, regardless of the race of the artist, regardless of the background of the artist. Um, and I think the industry gets into trouble when in a top down way, the way Billboard kicked Lil Nas X's song off the country chart, they try to say, well, this isn't country. Is the audience telling us that or is the, is the industry telling us that? And if you, define your chart around an audience, then the audience will tell you how big of a genre hit something is. You know, I mentioned um, uh, the Commodores briefly in that presentation. Uh, you know, Lionel Richie's a really interesting figure. Do, do any of you know a, a, rec, uh, a single from his Count Slow Down album called Stuck On You? If, if it's playing in your head right now, that is, for all intents and purposes, a country record. It's by, you know, a black man who charted on the R&B chart. And in 1984, when Stuck On You was released as a single, yes, it charted on the pop chart, the Hot 100. Yes, it charted on the R&B chart. But it also made it up to, I believe, number 24 on the Hot Country Songs chart. And I feel like that's about right. Was Lionel Richie a core country artist with a song that should have topped the country songs chart? Probably not. But was it, a re was it reasonable for Lionel Richie to have a hit that got as high as number 24 on Hot Country Songs when he was crossing over to that genre? Sure, and it showed about how much the country audience had embraced that record. It wasn't as big as that month's Alabama record or Judd's record or George Strait record, but it was big enough to get to number 24. That's pretty accurate. The problem has become in the digital era where all of us are piling into the same venues, whether it's Spotify, Apple Music, YouTube, and all piling into the same places, it's gotten much, much harder to say this is what the country audience is listening to, this is what the R&B hip hop audience is listening to. And Billboard has really struggled with this. And in my book, I, I kind of wrestle with how one should define genre in the digital age, because it, it is tough. But I, I come out at the end of the day feeling that the genre is still useful. So, Chris, I, I really have to ask you this. Like, why do you think Darius Rucker thought it was a good idea to get into Neo Soul? Because just to be just to be frank with you, as someone who is a part of hip hop's community of practice, was yep. coming of age during that period, I want to say that's around the time I actually got a record deal. I remember that album coming out. I actually used to work and you were with shaking your head Beaver at um, <laughs> at Hidden Beach at one point, and I was living in Philly. And I remember thinking, like, why the hell are y'all doing this? Like, I think black folk never thought of Darius Rucker as being authentic, and Neo Soul was one of the most um, stringent subgenres of vetting folks for their authenticity and their blackness. Yeah. And so for someone to have done Hootie and the Blowfish and then come back to, to the other side, as I like to say, um, it almost felt like O.J. Simpson going to a Baptist church <laughs> during his trial. Right. Um, so is there any, like, quotations or, like, any, I don't know, like, narratives for him talking about the impetus for why he thought that was a good move? You know, it's a question of who you believe, right? And the press at the time suggested that this was what Rucker wanted. In fact, reportedly, he brought... Um, his album back to then to Atlantic Records, Hootie's label, and they balked at it. Maybe Atlantic knew better. And apparently this was a side that he wanted to explore, if you believe the media hype at the time. And to some extent, I find that hype believable because the mere fact that Atlantic said, mm, not for us, and he wound up on Hidden Beach suggests that 
Darius was the stubborn one on this one. Because there's, there's another version of the story, right, where you can picture the label saying, well, you're going solo, you're African American, the natural thing for you to do is try R&B and you've got this soulful voice, let's you know, try and make you a neo-soul artist. But that's not really the way it went. Unless a manager was pushing him toward that sound, I call me naive, I genuinely believe Rucker himself thought this was a good idea. And I mean, if you're gonna go for neo-soul in 2002, to your point, there are a few labels better than Hidden Beach. It flopped because, you know, it, to your point, it was a stretch for him to even try it. But I think he probably thought he was rebooting his career completely. He developed a certain reputation with Hootie and the Blowfish. And if he was gonna reboot his career, he was really gonna hit, you know, control, alt, delete, and just try, you know, really rebooting it. And Here's the other piece of evidence we have. What finally works for him in 2008 is country, which is another massive genre reboot. I mean, maybe it's less of a reboot from the Hootie and the Blowfish sound, but considering that no solo black man had topped that chart since Charlie Pride, that was already a fairly bold move. So clearly Darius Rucker, whatever you think of him and his talent, thought, if I'm gonna go solo, I have got to completely flip the script. I, I, can't, I can't just do Hootie Light or Darius Rucker does Hootie. Yeah. Um, I have to do something different. And arguably, and I think I agree with you, the more different thing was trying Neo Soul. The less different thing was trying Country. Country was in a way a more natural fit for the Hootie and the Blowfish audience than Neo Soul was. But I can only go on the evidence that's presented. And I, the, the, the label switch and the fact that he later went to country suggests to me that this was Darius more than anything. Hi. Um, so when you're analyzing the charts for like a contemporary song, um, how, does, how do you account for new ways people are listening to music, like through streaming or TikTok even? Ah, uh, someone said the T word. <laughs> yes, uh, I was just discussing this uh, in uh, his class today, as a matter of fact. Um, you know, TikTok in particular, has completely rebooted our understanding of how songs go viral. It wasn't as if there wasn't online virality before TikTok. TikTok's only been around for about four, not quite five years. Um, and most people consider ground zero for TikTok breaking records to be Old Town Road. There were other records that went viral before Old Town Road, but none that topped the charts for 19 weeks as Old Town Road did. Old Town Road is far and away the biggest hit TikTok ever created. Um, but, you know, now, uh, as I was saying in uh, your class today, um, um, the current number one record, it's been number one for three weeks, is a song by Steve Lacey called Bad Habit, which broke thanks to TikTok. And what's interesting about the way, uh, when I write Why is the Song Number One, my series for Slate, and I'm writing about current records rather than historical music, um, there's usually some kind of online spur that leads to records catching on. The, occasionally you get a record that, you know, sort of the top-down approach, the old-fashioned way works, where the label designates this, this is the big new record, and, you know, people, I mean, we're about to see one tomorrow. Taylor Swift is about to release an album, I think, in Midnight Tonight, right? And, you know, Taylor being Taylor, and as big as a multi-platinum artist gets, it's going to be consumed by her fan base immediately, and I may well be writing about a Taylor Swift song a week from now. Um, but in many cases nowadays, it's a very bottom-up phenomenon where rather than radio dictating what you're going to listen to, the fan, the lowly fan, and it's not just one lowly fan, it's millions of lowly fans, are collectively telling the industry, this is the hit. Um, you know, the Steve Lacey record that's number one right now, it wasn't even the first single from his album. So it was the TikTokers who latched into its very emo vibe and were soundtracking lots and lots of videos to this song. Um, one of my favorite um, TikTok records of the last three years is uh, The Box by Roddy Rich, which was not one of the first three singles from the Roddy Rich album. They had made glossy videos for like two or three other tracks. And then there was a little squeaky sound at the beginning of The Box that a bunch of TikTokers keyed into and they used it for a bunch of 15 second videos and people played the whole record and said, oh, actually this whole single is pretty great. <laughs> and the box winds up going to number one for something like 11 weeks. So there are all sorts of random viral things that can lead to records breaking nowadays. And you know, the last thing I'll say about this is that, um, and I was, I was saying this in one of my talks earlier today, 
what confounds the music industrial complex is that they kind of don't know how to make something go viral. They want it to go viral. They want to concoct it, but it's, you know, and they'll pay off influencers to, hey, put this song in your, your video, you know, Charlie D'Amelio or whoever, famous TikTok person. Um, but it doesn't always work that way. And, and I frankly think the TikTok audience can smell something that's artificial and something that is organic. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's kind of how things break nowadays. All right, I have a question. Sure. So you are a man of opinions. You talk about your, <laughs> uh, you have passion for, I guess, or a lack of passion for Bon Jovi. Mm. Uh, but that's, a, that's an infamous episode, yes. <laughs> but you take a very, I think, journalistic approach to sort of how you see the data from the Billboard charts. Yes. But you have to have opinions about things you like about it or don't like about it, things sure. that bother you, things that you find very frustrating through the years of how it's developed. Right. What are those things? I mean, as I said earlier in the talk, my special sauce, what I do that you know, I keyed into as my brand is that I analyze the charts, but I write like a critic. And that's not something that too many folks do. That turns out to be a pretty unique approach. And so, yes, I'm, I'm balancing opinion and pure fact all the time. Um, one of the things I like about the title of my series, Why Is This Song Number One, is that first word, why. Why means a lot of things. It doesn't just mean, why does Chris Melanfi like or not like this song? And by the way, I've written about number one songs in the last nine years since I took over that series that I didn't like. I hated the song Rude by Magic. Ugh. <laughs> that light reggae song, ugh, couldn't stand that record. But to, to, to key off that example, it was a useful article to write because I talked about America's strange relationship with reggae music. I mean, here's this Canadian reggae band that has this very light, watered-down version of the reggae sound. And for some reason, we embrace this, where we never gave Bob Marley a top 10 hit during his lifetime. You know, So America has an odd relationship, less so than England. England, because of its, frankly, colonization and its relationship to the Jamaican diaspora, many of them living in the UK, has a much closer relationship to reggae than we do. And so that's a, that's a fruitful topic, even if I rant and rave about how crappy the song is, it's still useful to analyze why we have this relationship to reggae music. To talk about the Bon Jovi episode, for example, the inspiration, if you will, for the Bon Jovi episode was that Bon Jovi was getting uh, inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. By the way, I am a Rock and Roll Hall of Fame voter. I am a balloted voter. I did not vote for Bon Jovi, to say the least. And I was not happy about this turn of events. However, I wanted, I very seriously wanted to puncture my own biases. I admit that my distaste for Bon Jovi is to some extent irrational, you know, because I like lots of hair metal from the 80s and it's, there's something about John Bon Jovi's voice that kind of makes my skin crawl. Um, but by I wanted to puncture my own biases in the sense that you have to give, give it up for Bon Jovi. Bon Jovi changed the trajectory of hair metal and hard rock. Prior to Bon Jovi, other than one Van Halen track, Jump, which went to number one in 1984, there really weren't many examples of metal songs going to number one. Bon Jovi changed the pop trajectory. You can kind of divide hair metal into before Bon Jovi and after Bon Jovi. So like it or not, and I certainly don't like it, it's useful to, you know, it was, it was a great jumping off point to talk about the history of hard rock dating back to, you know, Blue Cheer in the 60s, through Zeppelin, of course, in the 70s, Kiss, um, you know, ACDC at the turn of the 70s into the 80s, uh, Van Halen, of course, and then when the Bon Jovi moment happens, how that makes metal into pop music, you know, in a way that it hadn't been before. That's an interesting topic. So I'm often balancing my opinion with the analysis and sort of saying, like, at the end of the day, you can agree with me or disagree with me, but I'm going to present the case to you, and you decide. So, Chris, one of the things that I so enjoy about your work is I find that you are very sensitive to centering the artist or the expert. For example, on your bridge episodes that you talk to, um, versus this balance act that you have to pull with your opinion and your critique. Right versus the fact, I would love for you to take a moment to speak to how you go through that act of centering 
um, the artist centering their work over your own analysis. Right. That makes any sense. Right, no, it does. And it's a good follow up to Lee's question because, you know, Lee's asking, mm -hmm. you know, you have opinions and I'm a critic at the end of the day, so, you know, how do I infuse those opinions? I will say that on Hit Parade, the Bon Jovi episode was to some extent exceptional. I've never done an episode where I disliked the core artist that much. Um, and nobody put a gun to my head and made me do that episode. That was my decision. I did that. Um, and to your question about centering, I, I am very judicious about how much I include my own opinion in Hit Parade. There's something about the flow of the show and the tone of the show that doesn't leave a lot of room for this sucks or I love this or that kind of thing. You can, I feel like you can usually tell when I'm a real fan of something. Like for example, in the first year of the show, I did a Donna Summer episode. I've been a Donna Summer, episode, um, Donna Summer fan most of my life. Um, and that episode came from a place of pure fandom and admiration for her work. Um, what she'd done with uh, her producers, Giorgio Moroder and Pete Bellotti. Um, you know, I, I did a Bee Gees episode a year later, and they're another act that, you know, can you tell I came of age in the late 70s, um, that I, I had long admired and, and I felt were due for uh, a reappraisal. Um, but, you know, there are definitely artists that I like and don't like in any given episode. Um, I was not a huge, I would not call myself a hater, but I was not a huge Mariah Carey fan in the 90s. And I often say, to digress for a moment, that when something is um, dominating the charts, if you don't like it even a little bit, it seems oppressive. And we often soften on things that seem dominant and oppressive. And now, I can admire Mariah Carey's talent. She's you know, a songwriter and a singer. Um, there are Mariah songs I love, like Always Be My Baby, and Vision of Love. There are Mariah songs I don't care for. Um, All I Want for Christmas is You is a, you know, a standard now for a very good reason. It's a very sturdy melody. It's a well-crafted record. Um, she sings it beautifully. It uh, calls back to you know, tropes that date back to Phil Spector and A Christmas Gift for You. Um, so there are elements of my opinion, but at the end of the day, I sort of feel like the artist has to shine. Um, and you know, I often get suggestions for artists that I should cover on Hit Parade. And I would say that what makes Hit Parade Hit Parade is that, again, the story has to have an arc. What makes Darius Rucker potentially a good topic for Hit Parade, and like I said, this might turn into a Hit Parade episode soon enough, um, is that there's an arc there. There's this boom, then bust, then boom again trajectory. Um, and that is driven not by my opinion, it's driven by the story. That's what I'm looking for is a good story, more than I'm looking for, oh, I really love so-and-so. I, I often joke that sometimes people approach me with, you need to do an episode about X, and I call those Chris Farley ideas. Do you remember the, the Saturday Night Live sketch where Chris Far it was called the Chris Farley talk show and he would have on Paul McCartney say, you remember when you were with the Beatles? Wasn't that great? And he doesn't have a question, he doesn't have anything he wants to ask, he just wants to exult about, I have Paul McCartney on my show. I sometimes feel that, that folks are saying, you need to do an episode about, you know, a good example is Bruce Springsteen. Folks were telling me three, four years ago, when are you going to do a show about Bruce Springsteen? And I would say back to them, I'll do a show about Bruce Springsteen when I have a take about Bruce Springsteen. And actually, that's one other factor in your original question. How do you center the artist versus yourself? In a way, the way I'm centering myself in a Bruce episode is that this is my version of the Bruce story. And I don't have to say I and me and I think because I'm giving you, my, my perception of Bruce's trajectory, if you listen to the episode, what makes Bruce interesting to me is that he was kind of almost the hipster artist in the 70s. He did not have top 10 hits for the entirety of the 1970s. And when he s scored hits as a songwriter, it was other people covering his songs, like the cover of Blinded by the Light by Manfred Mann that went to number one on the Hot 100 when Bruce himself could only get as high as number 23 with Born to Run. Um, and then, perversely, in the 80s, in his 30s, Bruce becomes a pop icon and almost a sex symbol, and also interesting at the, the height of Ronald Reagan, you know, Reagan himself invokes Bruce Springsteen, he becomes a symbol of Americana in a way that he hadn't in the 70s, in a way that would have been almost laughable in the 70s when he kind of was a scruffy bearded dude with a watch cap 
Um, that's a take on Bruce Springsteen. So in a way, the way I'm centering myself, if I'm centering myself at all, is in my take on Bruce Springsteen. I'm not gonna do a Bruce Springsteen episode just to say Bruce is a national treasure. You know that already. What, what's gonna make my Hit Parade episode useful is if I have an angle on Bruce that maybe you never thought of before. All right, I have to wrap this up, but I wanna say one thing. Um, if you enjoyed this talk tonight, we do actually have Jim Sonnefeld who has just written his own book called Swimming with the Blowfish. He's the drummer for the yep. Blowfish. Lives here, still lives here in Columbia. And he has a book that he just released and he will be here at the library talking on November 20th, Sunday afternoon about his book and he'll be signing. So uh, join us for that, but thank you very much for coming and thank you very thank much, you Chris. All. We really appreciate it.